Well, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's business success series presented by Manulife, Allies Against Islamophobia. My name is Ian McLean, and I'm the president and CEO of the Greater Kitchener-Waterloo Chamber of Commerce. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that we do live and work on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples, as we seek a renewed relationship based on a foundation of mutual understanding and respect. As participants in today's virtual event, we are coming together as one. We believe everyone is free to be their true self and receive the same respect and opportunity, regardless of age, ethnicity, gender, culture, identity, sexual orientation, beliefs, or language. We hope you'll join us in fostering a positive environment here today that is a safe and welcoming space for all. We know that there's more that we can do, and we are committed to listening, learning, and growing as we go. Today's session would not be possible without the continued support of our partners and sponsors. So a special thank you today to our title sponsor for the Business Success Series, Manulife, our platinum sponsor for the series, the Immigration Partnership of Waterloo Region, and a June sponsor, Learners. These organizations and many others are committed to supporting our local economy and providing businesses with the resources and tools they need to thrive. Just before the session starts, I'd like to go over a few quick reminders. Please ensure that your microphone is, is muted throughout the presentation so we can reduce any background noise. If you do have a tech-related question, please comment in the chat section, and a representative of our team will get back to you momentarily. If you have a question for today's speaker, I'll gather those throughout the session, and our speakers will do our, their best to answer as many of those as possible following the presentation. All attendees will be sent a recording of today's presentation, and it will also be made available on the Greater KW Chamber website. At this time, I'd like to now invite Graham Bennett. He's a partner with Learners LLP to introduce today's guest. Graham. Thanks very much, Ian. The Learners Law Firm is proud to be this month's presenting sponsor of the Business Success Series, and I have the privilege of introducing today's guest, Fauzia Mazhar. Fauzia earned her first BA in economics from Pakistan. She completed a second BA in psychology and her master of social work with a specialization in community policy planning organizations and a postgraduate certificate in leadership and management from Wilfrid Laurier University. Fauzia is also a proud graduate of LWR's community leadership program. Fauzia has 20 years of experience in the local social profit sector much of uh, which is in leadership and management. In 2010, Fauzia joined a group of women in KW to start a modest initiative to empower Muslim women to be leaders and change makers, able to address stereotypes and misconceptions about Muslim, Muslim women through the community outreach and bridge building, which is now known as Coalition of Muslim Women in KW or CMW. CMW has seen exceptional growth in Fauzia's leadership as its executive director in a very short period of time. Fauzia's competence in turning creative ideas into full-fledged projects, her ability to secure resources for those projects, and her flair in inspiring others to lead are just a few of her gifts that have benefited CMW. At her heart, Fauzia is an educator. She's developed and delivered college-level courses in professional training, including a training course on understanding and countering Islamophobia, which includes a significant portion on implicit bias. Thanks again for joining us today. I'll now pass it back to Ian. Well, thanks so much, Graham. I appreciate uh, the support uh, of, of learners. And, and this is, is a tremendously important issue um, for our community. Um, and uh, it, it's one that is of, of concern broadly. We, uh, we know that uh, we're better uh, as a community when we're, when we're together and when we're inclusive. It's one of the reasons, uh, Fazia, as we, as we get started here, that the Chamber has been involved in, in um, the uh, Immigration Partnership and before that with the, with the uh, um, uh, uh, with uh, Waterloo Region Immigrant Employment Network. I mean, the connection between uh, folks in our community, newcomers to our community, refugees, newcomers, immigrants, uh, the importance of them to, to the business community, but also 
broadly to to uh, the importance of of our collective community is is uh, is something that's really important to us and to the business community. So the, the, one of the reasons we wanted to do this is these un, unfortunately these uh, Islamophobia exists. We just saw this week um, the unfortunate anniversary of of uh, of a. Uh, horrific uh, incident in London, um, but it ex it does exist and we need to be aware of it and try and be uh, conscious and trying to, to how we and intentional about making change. So let's let's maybe start at, at the beginning. And before we, we get to that, I wanted to your your impressive resume, but you're also involved in, in a few things that I think are important for people to understand where where it's it's coalitions of folks. And so maybe I'll talk a little bit about involvement with or connection to things like the Immigration Partnership and some of your other activities in the region of Waterloo. Dorian, first of all, thank you for having me um, for this series. Thank you, Graham, for your kind introduction. Um, I, as I'm assuming you're talking about my involvement. Yeah. Not, yeah. So I came here 20 years ago and I think I just got involved as a very active volunteer in the community pretty quickly. I was elected as the first the secretary and the president of Pakistan Canada Association, started working in not-for-profit sector pretty quickly and um, became part of immigration partnership very, very early on. Actually, I was part of the process. You would remember Ryan, right? So yeah. a part of, I was part of the process, although I never joined Ryan, but as part of the process, I attended the, the meeting that sort of became the precursor for immigration partnership to be formed. Uh, that was organized, I think at Luther Village at that time. And then I joined the first council. I was a member of the council for, I believe, six years. And during that time, I also chaired the Belong, uh, Belonging Steering Group for a two year term. Yeah, and the Immigration Partnership Waterloo has three mandates. One is to welcome newcomers and refugees to our community. The second pillar is to settle, um, which is to help people feel connected to the community, get, you know, get themselves connected to the community. And then the working pillar, which I've been chairing for, well, as long as it's, I guess, 10 or 12 years, because of that connection between the existing business community and the workforce of the future of which immigrants, refugees, newcomers, people that uh, from coming from around the world are are the primary source for filling filling jobs. So there's a there's an imperative for the community in that we're going to see more newcomers coming to the community. Uh, we need them to fill jobs that are that are coming available. But with that comes the responsibility of of addressing and being honest about some of the issues that uh, that are not so pleasant to deal with. And Islamophobia is one of those. So maybe describe or, or, you know, in your own opinion, what is Islamophobia? Yes, Ian, that's a very important question. And I'm not going to be talking about my own opinion about Islamophobia. I will share with your audience and with you um, a little bit about this term. A lot of time, a lot of people think that the term was coined by Muslims after 9-11, the backlash that happened after 9-11, and a lot of time people are very surprised to know that the first appearance of the term Islamophobia was in 1923 in Oxford, Oxford English Dictionary. And it was actually based on the work of a French academic and an administrator who was in Africa in 1914, 19, like that kind of period. And he actually, he was the one who coined this term to describe the, the, the phenomenon that like we still use this exact same definition of Islamophobia, which I'm going to share in a second. And basically his purpose was that he was trying to tell the French masters that Muslims can be actually your they on your side. They just forget about the disgust or the, the hate that we hold against Muslims because of the, the faith, the, the Christianity and, uh, and Islam uh, sort of relationship at the time and, and build a better relationship with Muslims in colonized Africa, which I'm glad didn't happen in the other way, right? Um, so that's how all of this started. So in how it was sort of 
um, became alive again was that in 1997, 1996, I believe, in UK, there was a government commission um, that was established by the prime minister at the time, I think it was Jack Straw, uh, where they saw the importance of this um, increasing tide of hate, especially targeted towards Muslim in UK. Um, and that commission, again, sort of um, uh, uh, make this term alive, Islamophobia, used it. And since then, it's been used very, very um, sort of uh, regularly, in, both in academic circles, also in general in, in the community. So a couple things to remember, Muslims did not invent the word Islamophobia, and they did not also invent the, the actual problem of Islamophobia. This is the term that's been given to us. The term itself creates a lot of Islamophobia as we have seen uh, that people just don't like this term. Um, so in terms of its definition, it's basically um, Runnymede first defined it as an outlook or worldview involving an unfounded dread and dislike of Muslims, which results in practices of exclusion and discrimination not only for Muslims, but also for those who are perceived to be Muslims. So one thing to remember is that Islamophobia does not only impact Muslims. Um, the first person to lose their life was a sick man who was murdered in New York after 9-11. The first religious place that was targeted after 9-11 was actually a Hindu temple in Brampton. Um, so it's just not Muslims who are impacted by, um, by Islamophobia, also others were perceived to be, the, to, be the Muslim, to be Muslims. And one big thing people talk about, people like we have freedom to express, freedom to think, freedom to think and all that. Islamophobia is not about that. Pe people can have prejudice and biases in their heads and in their hearts, as long as they're not acted upon. We are talking about the acts, actions, um, that actually is, are, are termed Islamophobic. Um it's a good point, and, and I think I mean we're, we're talking about Islamophobia today, but we're, we're ultimately this is a this is a piece of racism and xenophobia mm -hmm. is, which is, um, you know, how would you know if you're is Islamic in terms of faith? Uh, some would look different or look similar to you or to others that may not be religious. I mean, it's 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 that it's that that fear and the, and the, the racism and xenophobia. And that's unfortunately part of, it is part of our, our communities. It's part of our, our culture and needs to be called out and needs to be addressed. So, and maybe you've sort of answered this. I mean, asking the question of who it, who it impacts, it most certainly impacts those that are being targeted specifically, but are there, I mean, when you, when you take the lens back a little bit, I mean, it's impacting, those in the community that weren't specifically targeted, like involved in, a, in an incident. Um, are there others? I mean, how else would you describe the impact of this either on the Islamic community or, or the broader community? Um, so I would start with the broadest, you know, the picture of the society. When hate hits the society, um, it harms and it negatively, it negatively harms everybody, not just the person that is uh, being targeted for that hate. When uh, any specific, uh, when the person is targeted for a specific identity, then that community specifically is also uh, sort of in this state of feeling targeted. So maybe the hate is targeted towards one person, but the, the distinct overlapping and intersectional like you know identities that this person has mean that the, the, all of those communities will feel targeted and the broader society will feel targeted as well because it disrupts the harmony, it disrupts the peace, it disrupts our own trust in our society, in ourselves, it doesn't help anyone, honestly. So in terms of very specific things, we already talked about how people who are perceived to be Muslims and you're so right, Ian, Muslims are seen as others. It's just not about the religion Islam, it's also about who are they in terms of their racial makeup brown, black, right? So they're seeing others at that point. Then they're seeing, uh, seeing others as, as the point of their hair as a result of immigration more recently. Every one of us is here as a result of immigration. Muslims just seem to miss the very early bus and a lot of racialized people like us just seem to miss the very early bus, right? 
So, but but that idea that that xenophobia bring bring comes in the picture, in terms of how it impacts um, uh, the Muslim community especially. So we see a couple of big trends. Number one, religious institutions and especially mosques are vandalized, targeted, attacked. We all know about the um, Quebec mosque shooting. Um, very very in a very high numbers. Many of these things we don't even see in the media, but that, that's happening very regularly. The second, or maybe even the, fir the first, I, I don't have it in any order, are the Muslim women who are visible as Muslims, right? So all of the statistics that we see from StatCan, not only in Canada, but in other Western societies, including UK, make it clear that Muslim women are, are disproportionately targeted, um, both in violent and nonviolent hate incidents and hate crime. The only other group is in Canada that is sort of at par with Muslim women is unfortunately the indigenous women who become disproportionately targeted by hate crimes and hate incident. Well, in their case, it's a little bit different, but yes. And, and, and then for men and youth, the problem comes with the profiling. They're seen as a threat to national security. So there was a study done in Ottawa, I think around 2015, 2016, after the parliament attack, where they were trying in Ottawa police, they were trying to find out um, if there is racial profiling, which groups are profiled. And everybody thought it, it's going to be black youth and black male that will come out uh, at the end of the study. Uh, however, at the end of the study, they determined that it was actually Middle Eastern looking men who were disproportionately targeted for like, you know, this, the traffic stops and things like that. Um, for children uh, from our one year hate reporting system, the, the amount of uh, uh, problems that they face in school, both by peers as well as by teachers is very astounding actually. And then other perceived to be Muslims can be targeted for anything and everything that comes towards Muslim community from microaggressions to unfortunately, as we just heard, fatal attacks. So, I mean, in terms of the, the, the roots of Islamophobia, I, I wanna, there's a, a couple of things here. Is it is it as much about how you look, um, meaning th that you, if the perception of, of the look of, you know, you look, you're brown or you're black and you're, and you, you have a different look to you, or is it, is it a, about the religion? Cause it seems to me that it's, it's, uh, it's probably about both. Um, but, you know, if you look across North America and the, we see horrific attacks and, and it's, we're talking about Islamic phobia today, but we've had attacks on synagogues and at churches and in, in mosques, um, and I think back over the years, this community probably had issues when there was the Vietnamese boat people in the early 70s and, and you know, different communities that would, would come here um, and settle here. But I, I, I do notice that the, the community is changing, and, and, but it's not changing fast enough. So, so I guess the, the question, you know, the, the roots of Islamophobia, is it... Is it really the religion or, or do we need to put both of those pieces together? How you look and what and what, what your faith is um, shouldn't be the things that that um, that that determine how you uh, feel about somebody. So part of this is the history, right? So the historical encounters between the Western world and the so-called Muslim worlds, we have to think about them from the beginning, right? Um, both Western civilization and Muslim civilization, they've been exceptionist, um, expansionist in their sort of origin, right? Like they look for more people and they look for more territories, right? So they're missionary as well as um, uh, they, they advance their interest by um, going to other lands. So their encounters historically have been in the, in the backdrop of war and violence. So we can start from, for example, um, crusades, right? Um, that was a big time. And there was a certain persona of Muslims that was created at the time that really fitted the, the objectives on, on uh, the Western side, right? Like, you know, uh, barbaric and primitive and, you know, um, all of that stuff. And then uh, later on, the colonization period, where it was important for the colonial masters to make sure that their subjects are seen in their own population as 
primitive and barbaric and in need of control. No, it's not. It's the story is not different from what we see here unfolding all the time in uh, in the context of the relationship between um, settlers and the indigenous over here in Canada. So between these two very big periods of time where everything was sort of in the backdrop and context of war and violence and occupation and colonization, there was a time where Muslims and Muslim, Muslim world and the European, European world, especially at the time had very good relationship. And I'm talking about the period of European Renaissance However, in our collective history and in, in our collective celebrations, we don't think about those that those um, that period a lot. Mostly, what we remember in terms of images, in terms of you know uh, stories, are through the periods of conflict. Like I remember my one of my coworker one time told me that his father, whenever he became quite like you know sort of nasty, his father would call him a dirty Arab. So this is how people grew up, right? So there's a historical thing. And then more recently with war on terror, the need for the enemy to be continuing to be like, you know, people like to, 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 to uh, elicit fear and demonization of the enemy was very important to make sure that there is a reason for the war. The challenge this time is that now, just like earlier, we had Italian and Japanese and Germans right here, like in our, um, in our, uh, around us at the time when we were having sort of wars with their countries of origin. Similarly, now we have a larger population in North America of Muslims. So on one hand, their enemy um, because of the war, but on the other hand, they're also our neighbors and, you know, our co-workers and everything. I think this has presented us uh, a very beautiful opportunity to overcome that historical tensions and the need to demonize, in our case, the Muslim community or Islam or Muslims in general, and really, like, you know, continue to have these very genuine learning opportunities and and just see ourselves as as part of this beautiful society and beautiful country. Uh, you know, one of the things that strikes me, and I, I, you know, having grown up in this community for most of my life, um, seeing how much the community has changed uh, across the board. And I, the most visible part for me was volunteering in both of my daughters' class all through elementary school, reading to kids. Um, it's a bilingual. At school, so I had just enough French to be able to maybe beat the grade fours and fives, but the grade sixes were past me. But I could help. Um, but what struck me about about the classes that they were in is how diverse they were, and that the, that it was at least in every class half um, faces that didn't look like mine. So it, it, it which was a v very much different than when it was when I was at school forty some years ago. So, I mean, to me, I think the, the better days are ahead if only that kids don't, they don't see that when they first meet. That's just their, their, their friends. But I think we especially take in a lot of our own biases as adults and where we come from and how we grew up um, it are hard things to shake. Um, so... I want to kind of bring it, you know, for the bit for a business owner that's watching this and saying, hey, look, I got to get on top of how do I have better relationships in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion? How am I going to attract, um, you know, the best person for a job, regardless of whether they're Islamic or Indigenous or take your pick? But they need to understand the, the dynamics. So diversity, equity, inclusion is not something you can read a chapter and, and turn the page. It's a, it, there's, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. So, it, you know, here's the question. What does this, if, if I was, if you were going to try and articulate or paint a picture of what Islamophobia is, what does it look like? Like, what would be some of the things where you'd say, you know, Here's an example, and that's that's Islamophobia. Because I think people need to understand that some of these things can be um, either not intentional. They may not feel to some of us uh, if you're not in in that position. They may not feel like like why should that be a problem? So what does what does Islamophobia, uh, Islamophobia look like? That is a very good question. And again, what 
I do is I use a tool created by those who work in this field from Renimate Trust. And I'm happy to share this with your audience. I'll send a link to Saba and that link can be shared yeah. with the audience, right? So basically there are certain characteristics um, in speech, in writing, in, uh, um, in, in action that you can see and you can notice, and then you can sort of distinguish between, in some cases, is this a criticism of Islam and Muslims, which is completely legitimate, that should happen, and that has happened, and that will continue to happen, or this is Islamophobic in nature. And I'll tell you, the things that are Islamophobic in nature, they're so in your face, that you feel like, why are even people asking me that they're Islamophobic? I'll tell you one example. When I was working, I get one of my workplaces, one day a coworker, one of my coworkers sort of stopped me and said, hey, I've received an email, uh, like, you know, and th that email was that nasty email that was going around, making its round a few years ago, everywhere where Muslims were sort of talked about from anything from like mosquitoes to beating women. It, it was very low, very low, like really, really low. And, you know, I was, I felt personally insulted. She, when, when my coworker said that maybe you can, like, you know, you and I can talk about this because maybe we don't know everything. I was personally insulted. I'm like, I've been working with you for such a long time. You're working with a lot of Muslim clients over here and everything. And everything that's being, say, being said here, if you just have a bit of like common sense and you would say, for example, you look, at around, you look around and you see people who are Muslim around you, are they really breeding like mosquitoes? Maybe there are some who, who, who um, prefer uh, larger families, but others are like one or two children, right? Like you can just debunk these myths yourself, but they're not there. So basically there is a litmus test um, that I will share with your audience right now. Number one, when you hear, when you read um, things where Muslims and Islam is presented as monolithic, just like one big blanket, everybody is the same, whatever it is, static, they've never changed. They're the same people, same faith, same culture for the last 15th century. Um, that is a good indication that what is coming is coming from not only just sheer ignorance, but also a denial to, to know better. Then Islam, if Islam and Muslims in relation to others are seen as separate and uh, separate, like they're very different. Everybody else is fine, but Islam and Muslims. That is another indication of, of not really accepting the diversity within the Muslim community, the complexity of the Muslim community, the, the, the transformation, the like, you know, everything that has happened in the Muslim, uh, in the Muslim world and the Muslim community over the past 15th century, nothing in common. If nothing, there is golden rule that's common, I would say everywhere in the world. So when you see comments or read things where there's nothing in common between Islam and Muslims and every, everybody else in the world, particularly West and the Christians, then that is, a, that is a telltale sign that it's Islamophobic. The third one is when Islam and Muslims, especially in relations to West, um, in relation to West are presented as an enemy, as a fifth columnist, as inferior, and again, really completely distinct. They can never assimilate. They are always going to be other and different. There is another indication. Anything which is blanket statement, like you really need to question that. When they're presented always as enemy, they're violent. The only thing that they know is terrorism. And then Islam is presented as a political ideology. Islam is a lot more than a political, uh, political ideology is just a, a small, like, you know, sa faction of uh, probably the worldwide Muslim community, which is 1.2 billion, who have made it a political ideology for them, whatever form or shape they took, like ISIS and others. For the rest of the Muslim community, Islam is way of life, Islam is their faith, Islam is you know, their identity, whatever it is, it's, it's more personal than ever, ever political in any case. And when Islam and Muslims are seen primitive, barbaric, and sexist, like distinctly sexist, they're sexist in sort of some other ways. Everybody else is okay. But the sexism that comes from Muslim societies, number one, it's based on Islam because of their religion. Nothing about patriarchy, nothing about anything else. Um, even the men do not have to worry because the problem is with 
the Islam with the faith itself, not, not with the men in this case. And then the problem, like you will see the impact of these things as well. You will see the impact when people are actually justifying the discrimination and hostility towards Muslim. And that's where it's really clear. They're saying, well, they asked for it almost. If they were not like this, it would have not happened to them, right? It's very clear. First of all, collective punishment, nobody believes in that, I hope, right? So if a Muslim does something wrong, it means everybody in the Muslim community or society or Muslim world has to be like, you know, uh, has to have consequences for that. That's a very wrong idea in itself. So any justification of hostility and discrimination for the Muslim community that comes because it's their fault, that also a telltale sign that uh, it's Islamophobic. And when Muslims criticism is outrightly rejected, if they don't agree with something, it's outrightly rejected. I have experience of going, for example, to school board about a certain issue and another gentleman who was there who took to the podium and just talked to me directly saying that women like you would not have any voice in your countries. You come here and now like, you know, you're creating troubles for us. So really my criticism for the school board system has nothing to do what happens in other countries. It's my, like, you know, children, my school over here in my community. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, very helpful because if, uh, and, and this does happen, it's not right in any circumstance, but if you put down uh, everyone that's a Catholic to certain things that have, that have happened with, with priests or with uh, residential schools, same thing with any of the Protestant religions, uh, people don't accept that. They say that you can't paint a brush of Presbyterians or Anglicans or Catholics with one brush, and you certainly can't... Um, uh, shouldn't be able to do it uh, in, in this context, but it, it does seem that it's, um, and, and I think it, you've actually highlighted something. At certain points, Italians and Germans would have faced a lot of this because exactly. they were the new ones here uh -huh. uh, in terms of immigration and fighting a, a, a distinctly, um, you know, English European uh, environment. Um, so it, it just seems that uh, the longer you've been here, there's someone that's always new and there and, and that th that's the where the focus gets put, none of which is right. So so I, and, and, and so it, it moves to and I'm thinking in two two parts here, but I think they're connected. One is, you know, businesses and, and I put this out there because it's not really a question, but it's saying we have no choice in our business environment now than to say, Everybody needs to be put to work if we're going to have a healthy, growing economy, create more prosperity, be able to pay for the programs and, and things that we want to do, whether it's municipally, provincially, or federally. So all, all hands on deck. We know there's a, there's a talent gap right now. There are jobs left open. People aren't filling them. And so immigration is increasingly going to be part of, it has to be part of our solution. So whether it's it's more folks from Islamic countries or others, there's going to be more newcomers coming to our community. So, so the question to me is, um, or, or that, that I kind of want to focus on is, for an employer that's watching to say, I, I'm going to have to be open in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion, whether it's gay, religious, uh, you know, black, brown, is uh, indigenous, have to be open to those groups as well, because I can't fill my jobs if I don't include at least include that in my pool of, of candidates but how do we be an ally I mean there you know like the, like people talk about I'm an ally for LGBTQ or what and some of us just want want to know like what are the things that would indicate you know what can we do in our day-to-day -day lives as an example what are the what are the pieces you you you've you've highlighted where there are circumstances I I guess I grew up in an environment where I just, I, I well, personally speak up. I, I grew up with African and, and Blacks in my, in my house and uh, because they were friends of my parents. So, you know, you just kind of say, I didn't see them as that. I saw them as, oh, there's NU, or that's, that's you know, people that have, have come from different places. But we all want to be allies. And I think it's, it's increasingly, not difficult, but I, I think people want to know what the right thing is. Like, how can they truly be an ally? They don't want to make a mistake. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's 
I think we should acknowledge that and then try and really get at how can we be an ally. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's good that you actually presented or, or shared the the spectrum of um, different identities. It's just not about Islam and Muslims. It's also about our LGBTQ community, indigenous community, black communities, everyone. And you can see, as you alluded to this earlier as well, that Islamophobia is also just a, a distinct form of racism, but it, it is still an offshoot of racism. Um, so. To answer your question, it's a complicated answer. I, I apologize for that. So I think first thing your audience need to know is that um, a lot of time when we talk about racism or in our case, Islamophobia, we're thinking about what are generally co called as internalized or interpersonal Islamophobia. These are individual acts of violence. Sometimes they're fatal. A lot of times they're not necessarily fatal. They sort of range from microaggression to fatal attacks, microaggression, sort of hate incidents, hate crimes, um, uh, hate speech and, and all of that. So a lot of time we're thinking about that sort of manifestation of racism and Islamophobia. What we also need to remember, not just the racism and uh, racism and Islamophobia, but other forms of hate are also manifested at a structural or state or like you know societal level and also on institutional level. So if we just focus all the time on the interpersonal response to the interpersonal manifestation of hate, like how it uh, we see this when a person is affected directly, this may not be, um, uh, this is great, this is wonderful, but also we need to focus on where hate and discrimination is legislated and then it's meted out through institutional powers. It's very important. I'll give you a couple of examples. Let's think about residential schools. I don't have to go into any sort of details for people to understand what I'm talking about. At the state level, the state is legislating the discrimination sort of hate against in an identifiable community, the institutions, whether there were churches at the time or you know whatever, they are, they sort of become the agent to, to give legs to the legislated policies. And then people sort of become the, the become the, the, again, like, you know, they're the people who are actually doing things that the state wanted them to do and the institution sort of make them do this. Simil this is very same, similar or exactly the same for Islamophobia as well. So we saw bills and policies like Anti-Terrorism Act, for example, lots of policies targeting and legislation targeting specifically Muslim communities. It has been slowed down a little bit more recently, which is really great, but we saw a, a very large number of anti-Muslim policies and legislation coming through this state and, and um, uh, sort of like, you know, uh, what's the word, enforced by institution for a very long time until things have started to slow down a little bit. And, and, and uh, so really standing up and for now, we know about, for example, the laicity law, Bill 94 in Quebec, and we know how this is another form of state sanctioned infra, um, oppression. So really standing up at that level is very important as well for the interpersonal acts of Islamophobia. First of all, I think we all need to check our biases a little bit, um, making sure that, um, making sure that we also have a clear mind if we are encountered by um, a Islamophobic or a racist, like we see something like this happening. Secondly, I think um, speaking up is very important. Of course, your safety, in, if you are in a moment where something is happening, your safety is most important. You want to make sure that you're safe, but take action, right? Like it's so important. We just talk, like, don't be a passive bystander. Do something, whatever you can whatever make you feel safe and the person feels safe. Sometimes it's not in the moment, sometimes it's after the moment and that's completely fine as well. But really being an ally means speaking up, standing up and standing um, besides and standing behind. Um, and there are so many different ways. It depends if things are unfolding in front of your eyes or something has happened in your community. Um, so really like, you know, having a voice and, uh, uh, actions that uh, uh, confirms that you confirms your solidarity very important. 
Okay, but let's go to that one. Being an active bystander, it almost is a paradox or or, or at odds uh, that you're standing by, but but uh, uh, but that feels like you're not doing anything. But but, but active is that active support by just being there. Um, but but what the, what describe what that would look like? Give a couple of examples uh, where I could say I, I was an active bystander today. I gave I gave support or. Um, uh, was there in in a moment when there was Islamophobia or racism, frankly, or, of, of any description. But in this case, what does being an active bystander mean in, in this context? So I give you a story. It was shared not by someone else in a workshop. Um, they were on subway in Toronto and uh, there was a Muslim woman, hijabi woman there. And there was a gentleman who seemed to be quite drunk and had sort of uh, uh, alcohol with them and uh, they were really very threatening to the person to the woman in so many different ways and there were other people there but everybody was afraid of creating sort of an unsafe situation probably not only for themselves but also for the woman and um, or maybe it was you know just that f freeze moment whatever it was um, but what happened when a station came there was one person who stood up and just sort of took the alcohol or whatever, like, you know, the, the person had and just threw it on, um, on the stage to the station. That made the person left the train quickly to get their belongings. I know this is sort of a, like, you know, funny story to share, but really thinking about safety for yourself, safety for everybody else. It might be calling EMS, I'm sorry, calling the police, like, you know, 911. If somebody is in danger, um, it might be distracting the person who is the perpetrator. It might be providing, like directly talking to the victim and, and letting them know that you are here, you're watching, videotaping, um, whatever can help at this time. And what's very helpful is after the incident as well, saying something. Believe me, when we hear about uh, the interpersonal incidents of hate, whether it's racial slurs, hate speech, or lots of different um, examples, every time people talk about how nobody said anything, and there's so much pain in their voice when they say nobody said anything, nobody said anything, nobody did anything, nobody believed me, there's just so much pain in their voice because it's just not that they're targeted for their identity in that moment. Um, but also they're sort of re like they, they're re-victimized when, when, when they don't see any solidarity, um, then there's no solidarity around them. And a lot of times people don't do it intentionally. I wanna make it clear when I'm talking to the victims, I'm explaining it to them as well, that there is a freeze moment for probably everyone in that they don't know what to do at this moment. And there are a lot of things that are coming to people's mind. Like maybe there is something that has happened before. Maybe the person has done something, whatever, but they, you know, just overcome that fear and, and overcome that hesitance, hesitancy and do something about this in the moment. But also yeah, I, always I think be careful about your safety and everybody else's safety. Yeah, I think that's, that's true. Uh, I, the, the, I always kind of say this to my daughters. I, the, most people want to avoid conflict at all costs. They do not want to engage in conflict. And so when something like that happens, very uncomfortable, whether it's, you know, bullying, uh, Islamophobia, you take your pick. They And especially when it's someone in a public setting, they don't want to take it on. Um, one thing I would, I, I've always said, and I would say this publicly is, imagine if it was your daughter or son or your husband or your or your wife how would you want so would and you weren't there um so take away the religion part of it just as a human being there there has to be a point where you can and there are ways to as you rightfully point out not to directly engage even just getting in front of the person or you know pulling them away in that circumstance that can be an, an act of solidarity that where the the one person that is 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 doing the racist activity knows that there's others that are supporting. And mm -hmm. I think that is an important distinction though, is, is it's, there's a safety element to those things, but the solidarity of, of at least using your voice is, is incredibly powerful. Um, 
we're getting it's, close it's to the end. It really helps if you don't talk to the perpetrator, talk to the victim in the moment and say, I'm watching it. What can I do? What support do you need? Do you need to come out? Are you okay to be in? Like, what do you want me to do? That just tells them that, that there's something happening. And be kind to mm. the perpetrator at the time as well. The more confrontational you become, the more confrontational they become. So kind is maybe not the best word to use, but in general, like, you know. Um, de-escalate. De- yeah, de-escalate, de- definitely. Yeah. Okay, a couple more questions before we wrap up. Um, and I read in the paper today, and I told you I was going to ask you about this, which I, I found interesting. I think the it's it's a young man um, uh, starting a youth council. I think it was funded by the KW Community Foundation, one of the funds in the in the KW Community Foundation. Maybe talk about that because I think that's a that's an important signal to be saying the younger generation are are looking about. Um, in this case, it is a it is a a youth um, Islamic youth um organization maybe just describe what that is and how that plays into changing the narrative when it comes to islamophobia and getting more comfortable that that you know with 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 this whole subject definitely so one thing that i want to remind to your to those who are listening that we have a whole generation of young Muslims who have grown up under the shadow of 9-11. People who were very young at the time or or who were born there or a little bit afterwards. Um, They've spent a good part of their life in uh, in, um, situations where they were targeted for their identity um, very, very regularly not only like at, again, at the interpersonal level, but also in the form of of policies and legislations and whatnot. So on one hand, this generation of Muslims is more prone to more at risk of like mental health issues and stress and anxiety and everything that you can think about fear and all of the psychological impact that a member of a marginalized community that is very deliberately and very consistently targeted for um, hate and discrimination can feel as part of that community. So they, they're growing up in that environment. And of course, they're paying a cost. On the other hand, it has also created a lot of resist- resilience within the Muslim youth in terms of their identity formation and giving them and it has given them an opportunity to look at who they are in in these difficult circumstances. So this idea of Muslim Youth Council is based on sort of harnessing that resilience, that sort of um, uh, a a desire to change things, to make things better for themselves and for others, to sort of harness that energy and work on the issue which I described on the other side, the increased challenges with mental health for everyone as we know. But again, there's an intersectionality here. Young Muslim, you, uh, young Muslims, is men and women and everyone, like, you know, all genders, not just that. So working on that. So this youth council uh, is going to work on conducting a mental health and well-being study of racialized Muslim youth in Waterloo region, sort of looking at best practices in our mental health support system um, to replicate and also looking at gaps. Once they have completed the study, they will take the results outcomes to various stakeholders here, including school board and and other like you know system leaders to see to 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 spark change that can help themselves and other racialized youth. Well, that's that's uh, that's exciting and uh, and welcome. Okay, uh, one more quick question, and then we'll, we'll I'll ask you for some wrap uh, closing thoughts. Um, if I'm a small business or chamber member or not, but but uh, anyone that's watching today, either live or when they see the YouTube or uh, or, or our um, uh, recording through social media, um, what or how should businesses in a workplace uh, get started to to be uh, to address the issue um, or be an ally? I mean, what wh- what are the things that a small business can do? Give us a, like your top three things that we can, because it's a journey, you can't do it all at once. Well, what are some of the, the ways that people get started and feel as though they're, they're um, making a difference and in fact, making a difference? 
I think number one is always going to be educate yourself, right? Like learn more. We know nothing if we know nothing. We don't know what we don't know. So really educating yourself, um, taking, uh, making use of every single opportunity or and as much as many opportunities as possible in our community. They're often free of charge and and also there's a lot of other information available. So educating yourself is number one. The second is really change it starts as small, like not thinking about big, thing, big things as well. What is under my own control? Like what is in my power to, to do? A small thing, a small change that you can bring to your business environment, whether it's about more um, sort of a non-discriminatory policies to hire, supporting someone who needs accommodation for disability or for, uh, for religion or for anything. Anything that you can do that is in your power, that would be an amazing thing to do. I know you're talking about small and medium-sized businesses. They do great work, but they have very little resources. And that's why I'm keeping it to some things very, very basic. And mm -hmm. then the third thing I would say, whatever is in your capacity in terms of supporting the work. In our case, we would say the work that we're doing in, in terms of supporting victims of hate and discrimination where they need help with counseling, a lot of other things. If there is something that you're able to do supporting that work, both in terms of uh, dollars, but also time, volunteering, supporting in other ways, um, in terms of amplifying our voices, anything like that, would be really helpful. The, any support that you can provide to the work that's been happening um, in the community. In our case, I would say Coalition of Muslim Women of KW. Okay. So uh, it, just as we wrap up, as you are, we've, we've talked for close to an hour. Uh, wh what would be the, you know, what are the, the couple of takeaways you'd like people to think about when we think about Islamophobia, how to deal with it? Um, um, you know, what are, what are the, what's the, the headline and the first paragraph you want to take away from this, uh, from this session today? Um, so remember that Islamophobia exists at different levels. So when we are looking at solutions, we're looking at a structured, a structural level, institutional level, and interpersonal level. Number two, remember that Islamophobia does not impact only the Muslim community, only the targeted community. It impacts everyone because it disrupts the peace and harmony in the society. Remembering that and remembering that even the, even the direct victims of Islamophobia may or may not be Muslims. They can be people who are perceived to be Muslims. Um, so remember that and then remember to be an ally and in any way, whatever you can do in your capacity to be an ally, that's very, very important. Um, I think that's about it. Is there anything else you would no, no, that, it's, it's fabulous. I really appreciate you taking the time today, Raji, and we've worked together on, on many different things through the, the partnership and others. Uh, so thank you. I know your leadership is, uh, is important uh, and it's valued and, uh, and I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to join us on our session today. Thank you so much for the invitation. All right. And that does bring us to the end of today's session. I want to once again thank our title sponsor for the series, Manulife, uh, our platinum sponsor for the series, our friends at the Immigration Partnership of Waterloo Region, and the June's sponsor, Graham and the folks at Learners. And finally, to all of you for joining us today, as a reminder, we do host a new Business Success Series session every Wednesday at 1 p.m. To register or find out more about other upcoming events, please visit greaterkwchamber.com. And do share this series with your friends and colleagues. Join us every Wednesday afternoon for another business success, success series. Because if it is one, if it's Wednesday, it is the business success series. Thanks so much, everyone, and have a great afternoon.